If you're listening to this podcast, it's probably because a child you love and care for is differently wired. Are they also struggling in their current educational setting, seen only for what they're doing wrong while longing for positive relationships with peers and others? Envision a world where your child's unique abilities are not just recognized, but celebrated. A world where they can connect with others and their true potential is seen and appreciated. The Strength-Based Assessment Lab's mission is to build a world for your child just like that. Through its innovative approach, it aims to empower students, families, educators, and professionals to create positive, effective, and collaborative learning experiences. Be a part of shaping a brighter future for your child. Visit www.bgs.edu to learn more about what a strength-based assessment could mean for your family. That's bgs.edu. When a parent is parenting, are they parenting to change their kid's behavior? Are they parenting to manage their kid? Or are they parenting because these are values, these are standards, these are expectations, and I'm clarifying those. So parents need to focus on parental functions, what belongs to me and what belongs to my kid. Welcome to the Tilt Parenting Podcast, a podcast featuring interviews and conversations aimed at inspiring, informing, and supporting parents raising differently wired kids. I'm your host, Debbie Reber, and I'm really looking forward to the subject of today's episode. We spend a lot of time talking about the needs of our kids in the primary school years, ages six, seven, eight, nine, as that's often when neurodifferences are really beginning to stand out and make themselves known. But what we haven't done a lot of yet in the Tilt podcast is talk about teenagers and the challenges parents raising differently wired adolescents are dealing with. So today I'm happy to be talking with Neil Brown, a licensed clinical social worker and the author of a new book all about teens called Ending the Parent-Teen Control Battle, Resolve the Power Struggle and Build Trust, Responsibility and Respect. Neil works with parents, teens, couples, and adults as a therapist, and he has the unique experience of having worked as a teacher in a school for children with developmental delays. So he finds himself supporting families dealing with developmental disorders, spectrum disorders, highly sensitive teens, and more. No matter what age your child is, I know you'll get something valuable out of our conversation because what I know for sure is, especially as I'm adapting to my new 12 year old and all the new stuff that comes along with being on the verge of teendom, all kids grow up eventually. As always, thanks for listening to the Tilt Parenting Podcast. To learn more about Tilt, visit www.tiltparenting.com. Hey everyone, this is Debbie Reber with the Tilt Parenting Podcast, and I'm happy to welcome today's guest to the show, Neil Brown. Hi, Neil. Hi, Debbie. So I'm really looking forward to talking about your brand new book and your work with teens. But before we do that, I always like to start conversations by just learning more about who our guests are. So would you mind just taking a few minutes to tell us your story. I'm sure it takes more than a few minutes for your whole story, but, um, you know, maybe how you got into doing this work with children and teens. Okay. Well, here's going way back when I was a VISTA volunteer, which was Volunteers in Service to America. That was in my 20s, which was quite a few years ago. I was a teacher in a school for developmentally delayed kids and young adults in a very rural part of Southern Colorado. So it was it was pretty cold and it was uh, pretty remote. And in, when I went there, found that the kids were not doing all that well. And the teaching staff there had a pretty negative tone and the kids never seemed very happy or engaged. And we started going out to the family's homes, which sometimes was a long drive, 40, 50 miles out. And sometimes they spoke a language that I didn't speak. They spoke Spanish and I was uh, a newcomer to the language and they did broken English. I did broken Spanish. And we basically wanted to connect with them and say, hey, your kids are fabulous. We really like them, like having them and please come visit us. And we had some potlucks. And before you know it, these uh, kids were lighting up and the parents were proud of their kids and they were seeing their work. We went to the Special Olympics. We started doing some really fun things. So it was then and there that I realized that there's a magic power in families, that families can make the real big difference. And I thought, hmm, that's really interesting. And then I discovered from a social worker that was working at the school that there's this thing called family therapy. And I said, wow, 
that's what I want to study. And so I started thinking about graduate schools and the University of Denver had uh, family therapy one and family therapy two. And there I went. And I've been a, a family therapy junkie ever since. I've been really studying it. I went to uh, the Philadelphia Child Guidance Center and studied under uh, Salvador Mnuchin. Uh, we had a clinic in, in Santa Cruz that was a youth service agency that was designed to work with kids that were adjudicated. Uh, in other words, they had gotten in trouble with the law and work with them and their families. And we started using the structural family therapy model. And then I went into private practice. Uh, and that was in 1984 to date myself. And I've been in <laughs> private practice, but still every day trying to figure out what is the secret? How do I help this family change from a negative pattern to a positive pattern? What's the secret? And so I've been developing that. And finally, when I got to a model that incorporated all the things I learned for parents and teens, I wrote my book, Ending the Parent-Teen Control Battle. That's a great story. And it it's fantastic that you've been doing this for so long. And I can only imagine that a lot has changed. You know, that have you seen just even in terms of recognition of ways of thinking and being for kids and, you know, the focus at Tilt is on differently wired kids. It must really be incredible what you've kind of seen and how research has changed while you've been practicing. That's very true. And I think it's a, it's, um, I'd say there's real positive change and there's some also very destructive change at the same time. The positive change, of course, is now we recognize kids with uh, differences. As a matter of fact, now we're beginning to see that even the word differences is obsolete because every kid is unique. So instead of saying this is a kid with differences, it's like, well, which differences? Because we're all unique and very different. So I think we've learned a lot more about the human brain, the adolescent brain, child brain, developmental brains. We've learned that there is this thing called uh, neuroplasticity. And we've learned that there are really ways that we can identify and help kids uh, from all walks of life. And we don't have to uh, marginalize kids that don't fit uh, the mold. So I think that's mm -hmm. fabulous. And we need to continue that and do more of that because it's not yet where it needs to be. But the, the negative side, I think, is that insurance companies uh, have looked to minimize therapy because it's expensive. And so family therapy, which is something they barely recognize at all, and sometimes it takes more than your 50-minute hour to conduct a healthy, productive session. And so insurance companies are looking for emphasizing diagnosis and treatment, and they just as soon give medication as they would psychotherapy, which is uh, more expensive in the short run. Um, I'm not convinced it's more expensive in the long run. So, mm -hmm. and family therapy, I think, is is an art form. It's something that takes a lot of, not only do you have to understand the kid, not only do you have to understand the parents, you really have to understand the dynamic that's going on throughout the family and be able to spot that dynamic and work to change the dynamic. And, you know, I think the the model that's being used right now is very much an individual model that tries to look at the problem within the person as opposed to the problem within the system. And that's what my book is about. It's really looking at how to help families see that the problem is not within their kid or within them. It is very often problems exist in the pattern of interaction that limits a kid's development. It's so true. And, you know, I couldn't agree more that so much of the emphasis on treatment and support is either just on the kid, mostly on the kid and the child's problems or challenges or differences, and very little on supporting parents separately, you know, in, in a parent coaching or parent therapy kind of model. But yeah, probably at the bottom of that list is family therapy. And it totally makes sense. It really is about the dynamic. So I love that that's the angle that you um, have taken in writing, writing your book. Thanks. I, I couldn't agree more. So let's get into it then. So, um, you know, I think that most of us, if not all of us who are raising differently why our kids are very familiar with control battles, at least in my house, we're very familiar. And my, I have a son who he just turned uh, 12. But when he was younger, one of his diagnoses was, I think it was disruptive behavioral disorder, not otherwise specified because he was so 
oppositional about so many things. You know, he also has ADHD and Asperger's. Uh And when he was younger, one therapist told us, I remember this very clearly, she said that we may not you know, we may not have a lot of the typical teen pushback and battles for control because he basically spent all of his early years pushing back. (laughs) I'm not counting on that, but I can (laughs) hope. But so the title of your book is Ending the Parenting Control Battle. Could you start this conversation by telling us how do you define control battle? Like, what does that typically look like in teens? And I know we can talk about children too, but I want to make sure we cover the, the teen experience here as well. As parents of teens have all experienced, as as kids move into their teen years, you know, that's a transition from childhood to young adulthood. And they start to push away from family and they start to over more identify with their peer group than with their family and start to develop behaviors that are, that are pushback. Uh, they want to define themselves according to their music, according to their friends, and they want less to do with their families and they want to be uh, less compliant with what, parents have to say so and plus they want more privileges and they want more independence and so that's the negotiation that goes on between parents and kids and it's quite normal and it doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything bad going on it's just is that's just the nature of the beast however when families and kids get into a pattern of interaction where parents are constantly trying to get the kids to either do or not do certain behaviors and then those kids are resisting those efforts on their parents' part and they're trying to avoid parental control and they're pushing against parental authority, then that pattern can become rigidified so that parents anticipate that everything their kid's going to do, they're going to get pushed back from. And kids anticipate that no matter what they do, their parents are going to be critical and controlling. And so those patterns develop where kids put their effort into resistance instead of putting their efforts into development. And parents end up in a state of uh, frustration that feels very much like they've got their hands tied, very much like if they if if you would picture, you know, driving your car and then getting caught on the shoulder on the side of the road and trying to pull your way out, except you're in the mud. And the more you step on the gas, the more you sink. And then when you don't step on the gas, you just sit there. And sometimes that's what parents feel like, that if they try to do something with their kid, they're just going to just going to make it worse. And if they don't do something with their kid, they're just nothing positive is going to happen. So they feel like they've got two bad options. And that's when they're definitely grooved into into a control battle. And so what I've done in the book is I've personified the control battle. I've said, look, the problem is not you, the parent. And the problem is not your wonderful kid. The problem is that you've gotten into a pattern. And let's fight the pattern, not each other. And I've personified the pattern and I've called it the beast. So now the control battle is the beast and the parent's challenge and the kid's challenge is to defeat the beast. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> and it makes a certain and it makes a lot of sense because parents and kids want the same thing. Parents want their kids to be successful and happy and kids want to be successful and happy. So they share the same goal. The question is how they're going to get there. So they need to look at, say, okay, we share the same goal. What's going on here? And they'll say, I get it. We have a beast in our relationship. What feeds the beast? And once they look at what they're doing that feeds the beast, then they can look at changing the things that feed the beast. And now their goal is to starve the beast. And I can create an alliance between parents and kids to starve the beast. Just to go back to what you said, this kind of pushback as teens are looking for more independence and figuring out how they want to define themselves. And you said that this is normal. I mean, isn't it this isn't it's not just normal. Isn't this what we what they're supposed to do? Like we want them to be doing this, right? Exactly. I think that's very healthy when kids are saying I want these privileges. And then parents can say, well, that's fabulous that you want those privileges. Can you manage the responsibilities that go along with those privileges? And when kids can align the privileges they want with the responsibilities that go along with those privileges, then parents can feel pretty confident in granting them. Not to say that kids won't stumble and fall, but that's, you know, part of the learning and growing experience and parents can work with their kids around that. Darren and I are prepping for a big move at the moment, so we are fully leaning into any and everything that simplifies things, and that absolutely includes mealtimes. 
At a time when my executive functioning skills are being pushed to the limit, even planning and executing dinner for our family these days can feel like a really big lift. That's why I'm especially grateful for Green Chef, a meal service that offers pre-measured and prepped ingredients to my door. Each box is packed with foods you can feel good about, like whole fruits and vegetables, plus lean protein and whole grain options. In fact, one of the things I love most about Green Chef is that they offer options that prioritize gut and brain health, with science-backed recipes that feature ingredients like fiber, antioxidants, and omega-3 fatty acids. During this time of lots of stress, it feels really grounding to know we're supporting ourselves nutritionally. I will take all the support I can get. And Green Chef doesn't just cover dinner recipes. I can add high quality breakfasts, lunches, and snacks to my weekly box from Green Market. Green Chef has a special offer for Tilt listeners. Go to greenchef.com slash tilt50 and use code tilt50 to get 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's 50% off plus 20% off your next two months when you use the code tilt50 at greenchef.com slash tilt50. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. Maybe I've watched too many seasons of The Amazing Race, but every time I have to go somewhere on the subway, I treat it like a competition. It's all about making the right gut decisions about which route will get me there the fastest. Sometimes those decisions get me where I'm going early, and other times my gambles don't really pay off. Probiotics can't help with most gut decisions, but if your gut needs a little support, Ritual has your back. Their Symbiotic Plus, a three-in-one supplement, has clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic to support a balanced gut microbiome. I've been using Symbiotic Plus for about six months now, and it's become a core part of my morning routine. I take the mini capsule every morning while making my way through my inbox, whether I'm at home or I'm on the road, because it doesn't need to be refrigerated. And the capsule itself is delayed released, which helps it survive the harsh conditions of the upper GI tract for delivery to the colon. And that's exactly where we want it to go. Ritual invested in a study modeling the human colon, which showed that Symbiotic Plus significantly increased microbial diversity and the growth of beneficial bacteria. There's no more shame in your gut game. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. Get 25% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash tilt. Start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash tilt for 25% off. Well, because our audience is raising kids who are in some way differently wired, you know, meaning they have some sort of neuro atypical aspect to their brain wiring. I'm sure they want to know what I want to know is, you know, for those of us whose kids haven't hit teenhood yet, what can we expect? So, you know, just again, using my son as an example, the years between maybe six and 10 were really, really rough years. And I that's pretty typical for parents raising kids who have neuro differences like ADHD or high functioning autism or, you know, because it's that's when the problems really become apparent in school. And that's when behaviors really ramp up. Mm-hmm. And with the right kind of support, oftentimes as kids hit 10, 11, 12, they are kind of changing and and maturing and maybe outgrowing some of those behaviors or developing in such a way with that support that they're progressing really nicely. So maybe parents like me are thinking, oh, the worst is behind us. And, you know, but I know adolescence is just around the corner. So because of the way that our kids are wired differently, does the control battle or the pushback, is it more intense for us? Or what, what has been your experience? Well, in my practice, Debbie, I'd say there's a high proportion of kids who are differently wired. And I think it's, uh, it's really challenging for parents with differently wired kids to know where should they set the limits? What should they let their kids do on their own? Where does their kid need support? And so particularly the parents that are listening to your podcast, these are parents who care deeply and are looking to find the holy grail of how to help their kid. What is that point? And so there's a it's, it's a dangerous line. It's a challenging line to walk, which is when does support become enabling and mm-hmm. when is support support? And so I think that's a that's a challenge for many of the parents that are coming in to see me because now they they think they're supporting their kid, which 
of course, that's their intention and that's what they're doing. But what's happening is they're over supporting their kid. And then the kid is fighting against that parental support and wanting to do things more independently and sometimes wanting to do negative things more independently or do nothing more independently. So it, it puts parents and kids into a real bind and it's a setup for the control battle. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> I mean, I think that is the challenge that a lot of us face in general, right? There's so, we're, our kids are on a different timeline. And so we're always wanting to give them the scaffolding and support they need to be successful and kind of make their developmental leaps. But I could see how how that could easily morph into a pattern of enabling or not knowing like what is the, is this behavior because of the way he's wired and his inability to deal with this? Or is this behavior something indicative of just more typical teen pushback? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you make that? How do you determine that when you when a client comes in to see you? Um, well, that's a that's a great question, and and I think a, a complicated answer. But I think the way it works is the privileges are the privileges, and if kids want them, then they do need to earn them. And that's one of the things that I emphasize in my book as a way to end control battles is when we get away from managing kids with consequences or punishments and put the ball in their court and say, look, if you want this privilege, this is the way you earn it. And when if you haven't earned it, then you simply don't get it. Now, parents can say, look, if you want my help or want some other help, that's fine. I will resource you. But it is your responsibility to earn the privileges that you want. So I think that puts the kid in charge of being able to say to their parent, I need help. Or I can do this on my own. But then the proof is in the pudding. Do they manage their responsibility with or without help? And when they do manage their responsibility, then they do get the privilege that's commensurate with it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so if they're not ready to manage it on their own, it's about making sure they know to ask for the support that they need. Yeah. So they're still in control. Exactly. And that's, you know, that's a skill that we want differently wired kids to have is self-advocacy. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, okay, you mentioned this earlier, and I know it's the name of one of your chapters, What Feeds the Beast. Um, love that. Can you tell us what, just give us some examples of the kinds of things that we as parents are doing to contribute to feeding the beast? Like, what are some of the most common mistakes that we're making? Well, I think an easy one is too much reactivity. In other words, when a kid does something that's difficult or challenging and a parent bristles and quickly responds, don't do that. Quick, stop that. Do this. Why are you doing that? And so once they get into that pattern of being reactive, then they're not in charge anymore. Then the kid's negative behavior is what's driving the parent response. And so reactivity takes parents out of the driver's seat of being in charge and be, and doing what someone might call today mindful parenting or intentional parenting. They're just in mm -hmm. react mode, and now the kids' negative behaviors are running the show. So that's one thing that will feed uh, a control battle. Um, and related to that is the whole notion of temperament. I mean, some parents are simply more reactive than others, more sensitive than others. Uh, some parents are more even-tempered, and some parents are pretty intense themselves. So you know, temperament can lead a parent to be reactive. And that's something they want to pay attention to because it will feed the beast. Mm -hmm. Another very critical one is a negative tone. Um, and I think probably many of your listeners are on to that, that when you're using a negative tone, it can really be interpreted by a kid as you're against me. And once a kid starts to interpret what a parent's doing and saying as you're against me, then they're going to become defensive and resistant. And I think the other thing that's very important and a little more complex is this business of being other person oriented. In other words, when a parent is parenting, are they parenting to change their kid's behavior? Are they parenting to manage their kid? Or are they parenting because these are values, these are standards, these are expectations, and I'm clarifying those. So parents need to focus on parental functions, what belongs to me and what belongs to my kid. So if a parent is trying to get their kid to do something, for instance, let's just say you're trying to get your kid to do his homework, Debbie, right? Which I'm sure this is a conversation you've had with your kid. 
numerous times. I'm, I want you to do your homework now. And then supposing the kid doesn't do it. And then you start working again. Well, you need to do it. You need to do it now. Well, I don't want to do it. And I want to do it later. Well, and you can get into a real pattern of being other person focused. And instead of saying, perhaps, listen, you need to get your homework done. You need to get it started before dinner. You know what the privileges are and you know what it takes to earn them. So that's the deal. You handle it. So now you're just being a parent, you're setting the standards, and your kid gets to deal with that in a way that they are now responsible for. But if you're responsible for getting them to do their homework, now you're back into being other person oriented, and you're no longer being an effective parent, and you're taking them off the hook from being an effective kid. Yeah, that's great. It's having sounds like it's having in that last example, just clear, like expectations or guidelines, maybe that you have developed with your child. And then your job is reminding the child of those. And that's kind of it. Like you can't, we obviously can't control what our kids do. And we don't want to be in a situation where we are trying to because someday they're, we're not going to be there. <laughs> they need to be able to do these things on their own. And when we absolutely, and when we give them the message that we will control their behavior, then they will uh, get that message and they'll say, well, you're in control, not me. So I'm not going to do it. You do it. You get me right. to do my homework. You get me to school. You get my lunch made. You get me to be happy. Yep. You get me to be successful. That sounds exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> now you're talking. And I, you know, when parents are in a control battle, I'm glad you brought that up because it can lead more than to exhaustion. It can actually lead to real burnout. And burnout is not just a phrase that says, oh, boy, am I burnout. out. Burnout is a real thing where it can, uh, it can have serious symptoms, depression, anxiety, ineffectiveness, uh, no longer able to think clearly, no longer able to be effective, sleeplessness, uh, exhaustion. Uh, all these can be functions of burnout. When parents are over-functioning, they can burn out and, this, mm -hmm. and they can suffer from, you know, from their mental health can suffer. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Just to going back to one thing you said about reactivity, I think that is such an important point, especially for teens, because I know in my kind of past life, I used to write books for teens and kind of self-help books for teens. And I know, you know, that communication is so key. And I know as parents, we might see our relationship with our kids change in terms of their willingness to come and talk to us about things. And I, I can just imagine that not reacting as hard as it can be is really important to make sure our kids keep communicating with us as well. You make a really good point, which is, you know, does the parent show up as an ally? Is the parent someone who is holding uh, the narrative that says, you know, you I love you. You're special. You're going to succeed. It's not always easy. Growing up wasn't easy for me. It's not easy for you. It's not easy for anyone. And I'm here for you. And can you hold that narrative? Can you hold that vision at the same time that you're also setting limits in, uh, in healthy ways? Hey there, it's Debbie. I love making this show and sharing conversations about how to support our awesome neurodivergent kids. I've seen how even one little insight from an interview can spark a big shift in daily life. But I know that raising complex kids can be messy and lonely. And just when we think we figured it out, something comes up that boots us right back to feeling overwhelmed and stuck. That's why I've poured everything into creating a way for parents like us navigating complex parenting journeys to join together and chart a path that feels positive, hopeful, and doable. It's the brand new Differently Wired Club experience. In the club, you'll get personal support from me and other seasoned parent coaches, six live calls every month where you can connect and get your personal questions answered, the opportunity to learn directly from authors and experts like I have on this show, monthly themes for getting specific and tactical, an exclusive private podcast feed, and the best, most generous community of parents. Seriously, these folks show up for themselves and each other, and that right there is really everything. Because it's a daily reminder that we're not alone. Our kids aren't broken, and we have totally got this. The recently rebooted Differently Wired Club is on a brand new platform with its very own iOS and Android app. It is such a great space. However you learn, whatever your style, no matter the ages, genders, and neurodivergent profile of your children, the Differently Wired Club can help you cultivate the positive shifts you're hoping for. Join us today by going to tiltparenting.com slash club. That's tiltparenting.com slash club. 
I hope to see you on the inside. Hey, are you a parent of a teenager? Are you feeling overwhelmed about how to be what they need while also holding limits and boundaries that keep them safe? Are you tired of conversations that negate how messy this season of parenting is? Well, I've got you. My name is Casey O'Rourke. I am a positive discipline trainer, parent coach, and the host of the Joyful Courage podcast. Every week I come to you with an interview, digging into tough topics with experts I trust and solo shows that go deep into the personal growth and mindset needed to raise teens in a way that grows them into confident, capable young people. I am not afraid of getting real about the intersection of conscious parenting and the teen years, while also bringing in vulnerability, humor, and lightness. I'm walking the path with you and honored to serve. Listen to Joyful Courage on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you consume podcasts. So I found statistics and and kind of looking through your book piqued my interest in a few things. I found statistics that say approximately 20% of teens will experience depression before they reach adulthood. Mm -hmm. I've also read that depression can be common among kids with ADHD and other learning differences. And then according to the Asperger Autism Network, a large portion of people with Asperger syndrome suffer from some form of depression. Mm -hmm. And I noticed you have a whole chapter in your book that is dedicated to how parents can navigate control battles if their teen is depressed. Can you tell us more about this? Are the strategies, I imagine they have to be adapted somewhat to accommodate a teen who's going through depression. Yeah, well, you're right on. You know, there are populations that are higher risk of becoming depressed than other populations. Uh, For instance, uh, emotionally sensitive kids are are more apt to become depressed. Introverted kids are more apt to become depressed. Why? Because they don't see, they don't become popular as easily. And popularity is, you know, is currency for adolescents. You know, when they're adults, they're, they're going to get over that and they're not going to need to be popular. They're going to have a few intimate friendships and relationships. They're going to cherish their alone time and it's all going to be fine. But in adolescence, the currency of adolescence is, is popularity. And so it's a, it's a tough road for some of these kids that are differently wired, sensitive kids, ADHD kids, uh, spectrum uh, kids, sensory integrated difficulty kids. I mean, these are, these are populations that are at higher risk of depression. And so what's a parent to do? And what my chapter says is, look, you cannot, as a parent, take responsibility for your kid's happiness. What you can teach are resilience. What you can teach are happiness skills. And so what are happiness skills? And so we can talk about that. But happiness skills has to do with knowing who you are and knowing what your needs are and finding healthy ways to get your own needs met and take responsibility for that. And I think parents need to be able to communicate to their kids that, yeah, this is who you are. Who you are is fabulous. There's nothing wrong with who you are. Adolescence is a difficult time. But when parents get into a mindset that says they need to make their kid happy and getting frustrated with their kid when they're not overtly happy, then parents start to, then we get into a control battle whereby parents are responsible for their kids' happiness. And then kids are responsible for, uh, are not responsible for their happiness. So parent is saying, you need to be happy or I'm not going to be happy. And the kid is saying, well, I'll show you, I'm not going to be happy. You know, in some ways it's conscious, but in other ways it's unconscious. They don't know that they're shooting themselves in the foot. They think they're mm-hmm. assisting their parents in creating autonomy. And so they can end up with eating disorders. They can end up cutting. They can end up depressed. Yeah, it makes so much sense. And, you know, it sounds like a lot of it is also just learning to respect your child as a creative, resourceful and whole being. And, you know, that we're there to support them, but we, you know, we we need to let go and let them have their experience and be who they are. Uh, exactly. And the struggle, you know, is is reasonable. I mean, let's just ask ourselves, how many of us went through um, our adolescence and young adulthoods without a struggle for figuring out how to be happy. Right. I mean, that's something we all have to struggle with. And so why should we take that opportunity away from our kids that it's not okay for them to struggle? Somehow 
We have figured out, because there's so much parenting information out there, so many parenting books, how to create this, how to make your kid this, how to help your kid be that. And at some point, you feel like if you're not, if your kid is not happy, you're not an adequate parent. You haven't done it. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to have a kid who is happy all the time. And there's no such thing as a perfect parent. It's ridiculous. You have to accept that your kid is going to struggle and you have to accept that what you have to offer your kid is your best and that's it. And it's okay for your kid to have pain. It's okay for them to have sadness. It's okay for them to have disappointment. It's okay for them to have frustration. Yeah, I mean, that's a hard one, but it makes total sense. It's it's true. It's it's interesting with my child, I'm seeing his emotional reactions to things change where his he used to just, you know, he had two... Uh, emotional experiences, joy and frustration slash anger. (laughs) And now, you know, we're getting some more nuanced emotional responses, including sadness when things are frustrating or when he's annoyed with himself. And it's uh, been fascinating to watch. And I'm, I actually am, I don't know if I would say I'm enjoying it, but I'm happy that he Mm -hmm. is feeling those kinds of things. And it's an opportunity to talk with him about things and talk about the human experience. And that's what life is like, like life is a range of emotions. I like what you you said about the fact that you're appreciating the fact that your son's emotional range is getting broader. I think being the wise parent that you are, I think one of the skills that I'm sure you're applying is just to validate their feelings. When a kid is sad, Mm -hmm. it's okay for you to say, boy, I really get that you're sad. And it makes sense to me that you would be sad because you weren't invited to the party or your friends are all texting and you didn't get into that group text, or you didn't get the part in the play, or you have to go to this um, special class and it makes you feel different. I can understand that that is hurtful or, or, or difficult for you. And, mm-hmm. and just to validate and make a kid feel seen and known and make them know that their feelings are okay. That's how they develop self-esteem is that they know that who they are and what they feel is legitimate. Yeah, I love that. That emotional literacy piece, it's really important. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. So a few last questions. You you have a chapter dedicated just to learning disabilities and ADHD. Are there any other besides what we've discussed already, any special considerations parents should be aware of if their children have ADHD or learning disabilities in terms of maybe things that are unique with those diagnoses and control battles? Well, with, within those labels, within those diagnoses, is a lot of individuality. So I don't know if I could give you a, a broad statement, but I think the, the, the message I would, uh, would want to leave parents with is help your child or teen develop self-advocacy skills. I think that is the ticket of success. When they realize, when they take responsibility for getting the help and support they need on their terms. And as a young adolescent, they're not going to be able to do that. They're not going to be able to do that at 12, 13, uh, or even 14. They can start to do it perhaps at 15, and they can take full control of it around 16, which is the kind of the beginning of their entry into their young adult years. Uh, my older son, Daniel, has learning uh, disabilities. And he, he did take full control of it. He let his teachers know that he had an IEP, and an individualized educational plan, and, uh, and what he needed. And when he wasn't getting it, he went back to them and repeated what his needs were. He checked in with his teachers regularly. We had nothing to do with it. He took full control over it. And uh, last week, he just graduated with his PhD at the age of 27. So, oh, my goodness. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. That's fantastic. And that's with ADHD and learning disabilities. So, you know, I, I, all I could say is when they're in charge, they're going to go the distance. When we're in charge, it's a major limitation because we cannot, we cannot do it for them. Mm-hmm. What a great reminder. Mm-hmm. So for listeners, um, I would love to just spend a minute talking a little more about your book, which came out at the end of September. Can you just tell us what your highest mission or goal is, like for what you hope your book does in the world? Well, you know, no one's really ever asked me that question, and I'm so pleased that you did, because that's what this is to me. It really is a mission. And I think there are so many parenting books out there that are fairly linear. 
if your kid has this, then you should do that. Or this is the way to help your child's brain develop, which is great stuff. Or if your child is uh, doing this, then you can and should do that. So it's all kind of transactional. This is the do to do book for, uh, for parents. And what I want parents to understand here is when they go to apply those skill sets and it's not working for them, when parents come to counseling, it's because they've tried to do other things and they haven't worked. And the reason it hasn't worked is because there is this pattern, this interactional pattern. And that pattern is what's so powerful, the enduring power of, of relationships. And when parents are in control battles, it's not easy. They feel very much like if they do if they do one thing, it's not going to work out well, and they do another thing, it's not going to work out. Very often, they feel like they're down to two choices, and there is a third option. And getting out of a control battle isn't something you do once. It's something that you have to choose your path, see your way out, and shift out into a new direction entirely, a healthy vision for your relationship. And mm -hmm. you can do that, but it takes that healthy vision of going forward and a commitment to it. And when parents get on to it is the enduring power of the control battle that's really limiting their effectiveness, then they can, uh, then they can shift out and get into, get their kid to back on a developmental, uh, healthy developmental learning curve. Right. And your book walks through how to have that shift, because I imagine there's going to be parents listening who and probably the same parents who come to see you. This pattern is so entrenched that it's hard to see that there is a way out. And so your book kind of walks readers through how to to do it. Yes. And so here's the challenge. I mean, I think if a parent says, OK, we're in a control battle, we're going to go to counseling and if they nibble around the edges, well, parents, you should do a little more of this and kid, you should do a little more of that. Often it's not going to get the job done. So my book offers a very powerful set of interventions that will push the reset button and get everybody on a new uh, and more effective axis going forward. You know, that's the, um, the beauty, I think, of my book, which is that it really does not just identify the problem, which it does do. Uh, but really gives parents a real set of skills to move out of a control battle and move into a healthy place with their kid. That's awesome. Great. So one last question for you. Where can parents connect with you online? Well, my website is neildbrown.com. And what I want parents to know is go to my website and for free, you can download a, an assessment survey do I have a control battle with my kid? And you can download that for free, uh, get my, uh, my blogs, my weekly blogs, and I'll be a, a resource for you without you ever having to come into my office and see me. Um, <laughs> there you'll be. I'll, I'll be the best resource I know how to be for you. Uh, but go to my website, download the assessment, take it and learn. Fantastic. And as always, for listeners, I will include links to Neil's website, as well as to his new book in the show notes page for this episode. And Neil, I just would like to thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing this really useful insight with us about navigating this tricky relationship. A lot of insights here. I've, take, I've taken a bunch of notes just listening to you and strategies I know I'll be bearing in mind as we go down this path. And I want to wish you the best of luck with your book. I really hope it does well and gets into the hands of the many parents out there who need it. It's really important work. Thank you so much, Debbie. It's been a pleasure to be here with you and your listeners. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Tilt Parenting Podcast. To learn more about Neil Brown and his book, Ending the Parenting Control Battle, Resolve the Power Struggle and Build Trust, Responsibility and Respect, Visit the show notes page for this episode at tiltparenting.com slash session 32. And one quick thing before I say goodbye, I get messages every day from parents saying they're so happy they found Tilt and that for the first time, they feel like they found their tribe and that they are not alone in what they're going through. So if you are listening to this episode, we want to invite you to help us get the word out to more parents and more communities about Tilt. We really want to help parents raising differently wired kids stop feeling overwhelmed and isolated and instead feel connected and inspired. 
So if you feel so moved, please consider sharing the Tilt website, the Facebook page, and or the podcast within your communities. Thank you. And thanks again for listening. For more information on Tilt Parenting, visit www.tiltparenting.com. Are you overwhelmed by the things that get in the way of you doing what you want to do? Are you looking for ways to simplify life to better align with your values? Do you want to create space in your schedule so you have room for more of the good stuff? Play, joy, relationships, gratitude, and more? If you answered yes to any of these questions, I invite you to check out Edit Your Life, a podcast to help you edit the unnecessary from your life so you have more room to enjoy the awesome. Through episodes with me, Christine Co., and a range of super smart, compassionate, and thoughtful guests, you'll come away with big picture insights and practical ways to declutter your home, schedule, and mental space without getting bogged down by perfection. I have always believed that small moments and actions matter tremendously. My goal is to help you find agency and space in your life through doable baby steps that will leave you feeling accomplished instead of overwhelmed. Check out Edit Your Life wherever you enjoy your podcasts.